Hello everyone, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. I hope everyone out there is being safe and doing well. I know a lot of you out there who follow my channel are probably familiar with my background in science and chemistry. And I read in the news recently that some hospitals once again are starting to experience a shortage in N95 respirator masks. So I wanted to put together a box that could sanitize these masks, get all of the virus or any bacteria on them killed so that they would be fresh and clean and ready to use again in case the hospital or the clinic is unable to get more masks in in time. And this would prevent the healthcare workers from having to reuse uh, dirty masks. I'm gonna show you exactly how to build this step by step. I'm gonna give the plans out for free. And I've already tested this system with this setup following the blueprints with very expensive ultraviolet light metering equipment. And I've determined exactly what length of time is necessary to completely sanitize one of these N95 masks. And if you're interested in building one of these for your local clinic or hospital or any healthcare provider, your dentist, uh, you'll be able to pick up the plans for free and you can do that and see if somebody out there might be interested in it. It just might help. All of the parts are available over the counter or online. I'll include links to all of the different components that you need. And it's not very hard to build. It's a little bit time consuming, um, but it's really not very hard to build. And so hopefully this is something that can help somebody out there or that some of you might have an interest in. So I'm not really gonna go very much into the science behind how and why all this works, but if you're interested, I do have another video on my science channel where I talk about that a little more in depth. It's just a short video, but it goes all through the science, and I'll put a link to that down below. The key is that you can look at a normal electromagnetic spectrum, and you see that the visible spectrum is right there in about the middle, and the UV is just a little bit higher than that. The ultraviolet spectrum is the UV spectrum, and that's light that has shorter in wavelength but is higher in energy. And energy is what does the killing, the disinfecting for us. You can see that ultraviolet light is broken into several different categories. And the ultraviolet C range is the important one, specifically at the 254 nanometer mark. That's what does the destruction to viruses, bacteria, anything living. Basically, once you attack it with the ultraviolet light, it breaks the DNA down and the virus can no longer replicate. And therefore, you're going to have a clean mask when that's over. So I basically built this box out of uh, one half inch thick Baltic birch plywood. You could use a number of different things, but Baltic birch plywood is a very strong material. It's very uniform in consistency and thickness, and I think it's gonna stand up well if this thing were to get a lot of abuse or get dropped or something like that. There'd be no problem, the box could handle that. It took less than one sheet to do the whole project, and I will have a detailed materials list also included with the plans, which again are free if it's something you might be interested in. And here we have the pieces the, for the sides of the box, the top, the upper half, and the lower half all put together. And so we're just going to do a little check here, and this is what the bottom of the box is going to look like. The bottom is just a little bit taller or deeper than the top. And I made this little guide here. This is this guide's about a quarter of an inch down. And what that does is that allows me to draw a line to get to the center of the thickness of this plywood. And you'll see why that's important here in just a minute when we go to uh, assemble this. So I'm going to use glue and screws both for the edges of this. And then I like to put it together in the right orientation and clamp it together snugly before I put in some drill holes and put the screws in. So the screws for this project, and there, there you can see what that line is for. That If I drill on that line now, that's going to put the holes in the dead center of the thickness of the piece of plywood on the other side. Now these are finishing screws. They're stainless steel. I've used stainless steel fasteners throughout. I know some people have mentioned to me that wood is not the ideal substance for a hospital setting, but I don't think, I'm not really envisioning this to be a container that's going to last for a long period of time at any hospital, maybe just to get them through a rough patch. Uh, but just the same, I've used all stainless steel fasteners. Everything has been uh, coated with about six coats of polyurethane, so it's essentially got a thick plastic layer over the whole box by the time it's done. Uh, but it certainly wouldn't be for any sort of a long-term or lifetime type use at any rate um, because it would be something that would have to be constantly cleaned. So that's it. We just uh, pre-drill some holes and then I put screws every three to four inches all the way around the perimeter and um, then I take the clamps off and we hit all the areas that uh, I couldn't screw in because the clamps were in the way. I'm going to show you the basic idea behind the box here. 
So this is the rough sketch of the box and I've kind of delineated where the lid is. The lid of course is going to lift off in the backwards direction there. And then inside of the box I have an ultraviolet lamp. This ultraviolet lamp is actually going to be able to shine light out in all directions in order to sanitize these masks. Now a lot of boxes that I had seen or different containers I saw were built uh, just basically square like this and so they varied greatly in the amount of UV light that was put out from one part of the box to the other. It could vary as much as a 100 times. So some areas would get a whole lot more light, some areas a lot less. In this box I'm putting a parabolic reflective mirror in the bottom of the box and at the focus of the parabolic point which is five inches up from the bottom of the parabola here this is where I'm going to mount the bulb. Now those of you who are familiar with parabolas and how they work you know that when the bulb emits light from this focal point it's going to go down and hit all the different areas of the parabola and it's going to come directly up and it's going to essentially hit our platform surface up there with some pretty uniform light. So of course the bulb is going to shine directly on the masks that are there and then the bulb is also going to shine down uh, towards the parabola because the bulb shines out in 360 degrees all the way around. And that light is going to hit this reflective surface in the shape of the parabola and wherever that light hits the surface, whatever that angle is, it's about going to bounce straight up and uniformly blanket the top of the platform. It's a grid that we're going to put in there. And so it's going to kind of give us a little bit more even lighting. And it's highly reflective. UV doesn't reflect great anyway, but the mylar that we have is about the most reflective stuff that we get. And you can, I'm kind of trying to draw masks here. I'm not very good at it. But this is essentially the bottom half of the box. And the, all of the masks, of course, will be fully illuminated this way and there won't really be any dark spots in the box or any areas where we have to worry about not getting light. And of course the top half of the box is the mirror image of the bottom half of the box. It also has a parabolic reflector so the masks are going to be hit equally or anything you put in there really they're going to be equally hit from the top and from the bottom at the same time. So you don't have to put them in there and sterilize them briefly uh, you know on one side and then flip them over and sterilize them again by having that light up top and having a light on the bottom and I even have separate ballasts installed for each one it's going to get the best possible lighting scheme. So I've run the math and I created the perfect parabola that will fit in this box and I actually have a PDF file for it so what you'd be able to do is print out the PDF file and tape it together and then you're going to have a perfect parabola for the inside of your box. And I just wanted to mention if there are any hospital administrators out here watching, I know I've sent this off to my local university hospital, uh, the University of Colorado Hospital, that's where I'm from here. And if uh, you guys are interested in something like this or you need something like this, let me know. Uh, this, is, this is free. I'm happy to give this to you. And if anybody else needs one or wants one, let me know. If it's something that I can put together, I'll do it. I don't have an unlimited budget. It costs a couple hundred bucks to put one of these together. But, uh, you know, I'll do what I can if I can knock out two or three more of these. And I'm hoping a lot of woodworkers out there will take up the challenge in the event that these are needed in your local communities. You can put these together and offer these up to people and hopefully help out the situation a little bit. I want to point out that I'm not coming up with anything new or creating you know, in any new technology. Uh, what I am doing is I am putting, putting together a box. I'm checking it with a standardized certified meter that shows the light output. I'm showing you the calculations of how, how much light energy that it takes in order to kill these things. And this is all in accordance with the CDC guidelines. And I've got about 12 papers, uh, peer-reviewed uh, research journals, that tell exactly how this needs to be done. And I'll actually include all of those, links to all of those, in the plans should you decide to buy them. Uh, everything that I'm doing here has actually already been approved by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, on exactly how they want masks to be sanitized in order to be reused for emergency situations and so we're, those guidelines are followed 100% here. I also suspect that anybody in a hospital setting would know this but of course this ultraviolet C uh, irradiation will actually kill everything living. Uh, it'll kill all viruses, all bacteria, whatever germs, microbes, you know, fungus, anything that might be contaminating some object or some surface it will actually destroy them all.
And so for those of you out there watching, you must also know that this is uh, very dangerous. Ultraviolet C light will cause cancer if you expose yourself to the ultraviolet C radiation. It's not good for you. It's not good for your skin cells. It's, it'll, it can make you go blind. It's bad for your retinas. And so I've created the box so it's completely light tight. And I have mechanisms installed in place in order to prevent uh, the, it from coming on. Um, accidentally because as soon as the box is lifted there's a kill switch which would immediately turn out the power should you forget to turn it off before you lift the lid uh, so there's a lot of safety mechanisms built into it here uh, but just so that you know it's not light that you want to look at or play with all right so i'm going to jump back to the build for a second here you can see that we i've used the tracing to cut out the first parabola and then i use that to uh, made that one sanded absolutely perfectly and i use that to trace onto all of the additional pieces of wood and i am going to use a pattern cutting bit in order to ensure that these are all perfect now you certainly could cut these with a jigsaw or with a bandsaw if you're very careful this just makes it easy to make them all nice and perfect I'm going to take a minute here to go over all of the items needed to put this project together. So to start with, we have a fused AC male power socket. So it's basically an AC male power socket adapter that allows power entry into the box and it has a fuse. And then of course we've got the cord that fits it. This is just a standard like a computer tower power cord. We have a spring wound timer so it doesn't require electricity to work and you'll need a timer that works for 15 minutes and then we have a limit switch this is a mechanical limit switch which will cut power to the box if the lid should open and we'll need some various wire to connect the various things together one thing that can be convenient is to have these quick power connectors especially because it allows us to plug quickly onto some of the different electrical devices that we have here and it's cheap. I think I bought the box of that for less than $10. This is a ballast. We'll need two ballasts, one for the upper half of the box and one for the lower half of the box. I think a ballast is about 10 bucks, not too much. And this is called a 2G11 socket, and it's what the lamp itself is going to plug directly into. And then I have two different types of lamps here. One is a regular fluorescent bulb, and one is our quartz glass UV bulb. We can't practice with that. We need to get the wiring going and everything with the regular flu fluorescent bulb for safety. Once it all works, we can switch back to the uh, UV bulb when we put it together. And that's a 2G11 clip, which holds the lamp because the lamp isn't real stable, so we put a couple of those in it. And I might either use the plastic ones or metal ones. Then we need a range of real basic hand tools. You can get a small container of some wire, and we'll need some black tape. And that's really all we need to put uh, this box together. But again, I'm going to have links to all these in the plans. Okay, so now let's start with some of the wiring. What we'll do is we'll go to one side of this ballast and we're going to pull off one red wire and one blue wire. Those are the two that we need to send into our lamp. The other four wires are not needed for this. They are for other things because this ballast works for different types of connections. So we'll clip those, fold those back, and we'll put wire nuts on those later. And then the red wire is just going to go in either one of the outer two sides. And they just plug right in. And the blue wire is going to go into the opposite of the outer two sides. That's it. They actually plug in there. You strip them down about a quarter of an inch and they plug in and that's all there is to it. On the other end I've put these two quick connects on and that's what these are here. They come in different sizes for different thicknesses of wire. You slide them over there, you use the crimping tool, crimp them down and that's all there is to it. And then we've got two short wires. These are necessary in order to make this connector work. This is what gives us an on-off switch in the connector. It, it translates the power through the on-off switch. And you can watch how I wire this here. I've also got a diagram for it. So I'll put a longer wire, that's the power wire, the black wire, the hot line, at the bottom, and the shorter wire at the top, that's the white wire, the return, the neutral wire. And we'll plug those on, just like that. So you may have to watch this once or twice so that you can see exactly what I've done. And the very bottom there is the ground. And I'll show you that. So there's our ground wire. If we look at the that there, that's the ground part of the wire at the bottom. And so we'll just plug that on there. And you see the other two plugs that are left on that, that's what's going to go off to power our lights on the inside. 
And for right now, we'll go ahead and plug those into this ballast. Now that's assuming we're only gonna power one ballast with this. We're actually gonna power two, but I'm gonna go ahead and put this together as a completed circuit so that you can see how it works. And that's it. So we put the hot wire on the top there and the other one on the bottom. And you can see how that goes together. As a close-up of that, you might want to pause and take a, a screenshot of that. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to attach the ground to the housing of the ballast itself. So I drilled that out just a tiny bit. They're, those are mounting holes, basically. And I've just used a screw that's big enough to make this work. And we'll take the ground wire We'll wrap the ground wire around the screw a little bit. And if you do a clockwise wrapping of the wire around the screw, then when I screw the screw in, it'll keep the wire tight instead of unwinding the wire. You'll figure it out if you do it the other way, because as you go to put that screw in, you're going to take the wire out. And that's all we have to do to ground the lamp itself. The grounding of all this, of course, is very important. Wouldn't want anybody to get shocked on it. And that's the, how the on-off switch will work. The power goes directly to the ballast. So now I'm going to go ahead and unplug the power wire because before this power, the hotline actually gets to the ballast. I've got to go through some stuff. So the power is going to come in through there, and then it's going to go from there into my big box. But the first thing I want to do is send it through a timer, a mechanical timer. I already have two wires hooked to the timer in the right spot. If you look closely, this one says line one. That means line in, line from the electrical source. And that one says load. That's going to go out ultimately to the lamp. So we're going to work on the line side. So then I'm going to take the line wire, the one that goes into the line in, and I'm going to plug that into the socket. It's going to go to the power part of the socket that I originally had going to the lamp, the one I unplugged there. And now I want to take a short piece of grounding wire, so like about a two foot piece so I can connect other things to it. And I'll wrap that together with the bare copper wire coming off of the bottom of the timer. That's the ground for the timer. We'll twist those together and put them together with a wire nut. Now we'll grab the other wire coming out of the timer. This one came from the part called load. So this is the load. It's going to provide power downstream. And that's going to go directly into our limit switch. So we'll just take the screws off, pull that apart, and we'll push our wires into there. That's the one that's coming from the timer. And since from the limit switch, we're going to have to go back to our, our ballast. Now I can take that ballast plug that I had originally uh, put on the socket there, and I pulled it off to, in order to get these other two devices in, and we'll push that through also. And this is how we'll complete our circuit. And so we no longer need that quick connect plug. I just put that on there to show you the initial completed circuit. And we need to strip the wire back a little bit. And we'll just need to plug these in. They're both going to go into the top and it doesn't matter which one goes on which side. They're both hot lines, both carrying the, the power itself, so it doesn't really make any difference which is which. And we'll screw those down snugly, and then we can put this box back together. If you're watching this and thinking of building one of these, don't get intimidated by the wiring or the electronics here. 
it may look a little bit hard when you first see it, but it really is very, very easy. Um, trust me, if you watch this a couple of times, you can definitely put it together. Even if you have no experience, even if you've, ne you've never done this before, it's not very hard. You'll definitely be able to do it. And you can always call me, uh, message me, email me, message me on Facebook, and I can help you through it too. Lastly, we want to take our ground that came off of the timer. Remember, we attached that little two-foot length of green wire, the ground to that, and we want to wire that ground in to our ballast here as well. And that's one of the reasons I got this little box of wire in the background. I'm not sure if I mentioned that yet already, but get a box of a different colored wire. That's also pretty cheap, and then you can just cut little pieces off and use it as you need to go through your project here. It's not very expensive to get something like that. So it's all attached. It's attached to the timer, it's attached to the limit switch, and it's attached back to the socket itself. So let's give it a test. We'll power it up and see if it works here. So I've plugged in power and we do have power going to that. So that's perfect. Now let's work on the other side of this and stick a bulb in there. Don't forget, we're going to practice all of our circuitry tests with a fluorescent bulb. You do not want to do this with the UVC bulb. That's too dangerous. So we plug that in, we got the power turned on, and I've got to turn the timer on to make sure that it works for a period of time, and we'll depress the switch, and there we go. There's the limit switch. Once the box lid closes, it comes on. And so that circuit is complete, so it's pretty straightforward. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's jump back on the box here, and we'll do some sanding, and then we'll work on putting in the, uh, the parabola. So this part should be pretty straightforward if you have traced it out correctly uh, from the pattern and you built the box right. Uh, the detail should fit in here perfectly and I, I like to pre-drill them before I put the screws in and we're going to obviously need the size of those screws to make sure they don't poke through on the other side. Now I did use three quarter inch thickness for the ribs here because I had that in stock. You could use half inch if you want to get this whole thing out of half inch ply. I put one on one side, then I flip the box over and put one in on the other side. And then I put two more in the middle. And the exact location of them isn't that critical. And we just want them about equally distanced apart. Uh, it's going to be more than strong enough to support the plywood with those. And then I've located where they are from the side here so I can get some screws in from the side as well. So the next step after this is kind of critical. We want to make a line in the very center of the box from left to right because that's how we know where to mount the light and that's important to get equal reflectivity. Then we're going to make a mark five inches up from the inside bottom of the parabola and that is the focal point of this parabola and that's where the center of the bulbs needs to be. And before putting our plywood on, I want to go ahead and seal the inside of this box with lacquer. We're going to give it about four or five coats on the inside, and then the outside is going to do uh, is going to have lacquer or polyurethane, and we'll do quite a few coats out there as well. Now I need to carefully measure the length of this arc because that's going to tell me the exact length of the piece of plywood I need to put on there. And for me, it was 28 and 5 eighths. It should be for you too, but it wouldn't hurt to measure it. So it takes a couple of people to do that, but you might want to measure yours just in case to make sure it's just right. And I cut that out of a piece of 1 8 inch plywood. And it should press down in there just about right. It doesn't come up perfect along the edges because, of course, the plywood has a square end. But if I take a little hand plane or even a, a sander, I can sand something about maybe a 45 degree angle there, chamfer it off a little bit. You can see what that looks like. There we go. And when I push this down in there now, it'll come up snug against the sides. And just gives a little bit better fit. You know, probably not absolutely necessary. It just makes it look a tiny bit nicer. Here I'm just going to make some reference marks as to where I want the wires to punch through at. One in the very center. That's going to be the wire coming up to the bulb. And one on the side that's going to come up for the limit switch. So it just takes a couple of small screwdrivers to pop this out, and it comes out pretty easy. It holds in nice, and it comes out pretty easy. 
Okay, you can see there I have put a, a single wire nut over the ends of all those wires. Uh, don't wire nut any of them together. They all need to be isolated from each other. And I've mounted it and I've kept my ground intact. I've mounted that to the bottom of the box while keeping the ground intact. There's my power wires and there's my ground wires that I now have to connect and put that circuit back together the way we did a few minutes ago on the tabletop. And this is the lamp socket, which is going to go right here. Okay, so I have that fully secured down now. I've secured the wires down. I've also secured the socket down here in the correct location. And now I'm going to try to squeeze these wires down nice and tight and get that thin piece of plywood over the tops of these. This helps a little bit if you can have uh, someone help you. Two hands is a little bit easier than one. You see I've cut small notches in the surface of this plywood or all the way through the plywood in order to put these down. And then we just push it in place. I did have to unscrew the socket in order to push this in place because I had to stretch the wire out. So I've just pushed the extra wire from that back in and resecured that back in the holes. They were already there. It's important to make sure that that socket's lined up right over that center line that we drew five inches up from the parabola. And that way we have uh, proper reflectivity occurring. And then we're just going to go ahead and pre-drill some holes. I'll countersink them just a little bit and then put some screws in. We'll do this all along the ribs to ensure that this structure uh, or that this curvature uh, stays down nice and tight everywhere. Then I'm going to take some aluminum tape. This is tape that's uh, oftentimes found in the HVAC areas of big uh, home improvement stores, things like that. And we're going to secure this around all of the corners to kind of get a nice tight seal. And you see I've kind of notched it at the bottom there in order to get, the, get it to fit around this curve. I fold it in half, notch the bottom to get it to fit the curve. And then we're going to take mylar. This is uh, an aluminized mylar sheet. And I'll have a link to this as well in the description. Uh, it's not very much for a roll of this. I don't remember exactly what I paid, but, uh, but you'll see that in the description. And this is what we're going to put for the reflectivity to, in order to reflect those UV rays uh, back up onto the substrate. And I'm using uh, 3M77 spray adhesive. We'll spray this on. We'll give it a few seconds to tack up a little bit. And this is a part that's got to be done with two people. So my daughter's helping me here and we just kind of want to stretch it out over the edge. Now it doesn't have to go perfectly from corner to corner uh, because we do have that tape there which will give some reflectivity. We just want to get it really close so I cut it purposely about an eighth of an inch narrower than what it would be normally to fit tight and I just take a, a squeegee which we use to spread glue out with and I'm, I'm uh, getting this thing squeegee down flat all the way around and then just a single edge razor blade will help us trim it all the way around as well. We want to, on the whole inside of the box, I want to have it completely covered with reflective surface. All right, so now we're going to go to the bottom of the box and I'm going to mount the power socket. Just going to find an area that looks like a good place to mount it. I don't want to end up drilling holes to mount it right over one of the ribs. And I've traced those marks onto the outside so I can drill a hole. And then we'll use a jigsaw to drill it out. And it doesn't have to be an absolutely perfect cut because the, the outer uh, part of the socket has a, has a little flap flange over it that's going to hide the cut. If the cut's not flawless, it's no big deal. And you can see there it fits nicely. And we'll just screw that into place. And that's mounted. Next we just do the same thing for the mechanical timer. We drill out the hole and here again it also has a cover plate which is pretty large which will hide the hole if the hole is not perfect, no big deal. And so the power goes on top and we're going to talk about this briefly. The power comes into the top here and then I'm going to talk about how we're going to wire this. So we've got a ground wire that comes up from here and you see I've made a little T coming off of it. That's a, 
the, we're going to plug in there and then the other part of the ground wire just comes up through the top hole. That is what I'm going to send up to the top one. So this is the difference I've made. Each of the wires coming off of here I've teed off. So sometimes this is called a pigtail in electrical work. So you see the black power line there goes in and it has a little T or a pigtail that comes off and goes up through the hole. And we're going to send that to the top as well. Same thing for the ground and same thing for the white wire. We're going to put this up here to hold these things out of the way here temporarily. So the, the white, the common, the return wire there, same thing. It comes up to here to plug in and I've also teed off there, put a little pigtail in that. And that's going to carry that wire also up to the top, to the lid. So that's all we had to do for the bottom half. We had to pigtail onto each of the three wires that we're going to plug into that and send them up to the top. And of course then we have to put our other short wires back in the same way I showed you back at the beginning of the video. So if you can't remember quite how that goes you can watch here carefully or you can also go back and look at the diagram or go back to the earlier part of the video and see how those things fit together. And that's it. That completes the wiring for the electrical socket coming into the box. And now we'll jump down and do the wiring for the timer. And remember this power wire here has to actually go into the mechanical timer switch. We had to take that out in order to install the ballast so it's no big deal. We're just going to put it back in the same place. And you see that's going to go back to the line in. And this is the one that's coming from the power socket. From the power socket goes to the line in because that's the line coming in from the wall. And the second one we have to put in is the one that goes over to the limit switch. And this one's going to go to the load because we come in from the wall into the mechanical timer. That's the line in and then from the load side that goes over to the limit switch. Now you notice on this mechanical timer there's another set of screws on the other side. It says line 2 and load 2. We'll just ignore those because we only have one device we're running off the timer. So we'll just use line 1 and load 1. That's it. Just make sure it's nice and secure. And I've already secured the ground. So that's it. Same procedure as before. We basically had to take everything apart to get it into the box. We'll just pull all the excess wires through and then I can go ahead and mount the mechanical timer in place. We just got to get all the wires through. We don't want to pinch or cut off any of the wires while we're doing this. Uh, if you need to make the hole a little bigger you can because the faceplate that goes over this is pretty large. And that's it. So we'll just screw this down. And of course, put on the faceplate. Okay, so once again, I'm just going to do a quick test and make sure that everything is working before I put the, the plywood over the parabolic curve there. And I can never remember if the line or the circle is on or off, so luckily they light up so I know. Okay, so check that out. I made sure that I was using the fluorescent bulb for this test. We don't want to use the UVC bulb. That, of course, is dangerous. And then we'll go ahead and turn this on, make sure that works. We can engage our timer, make sure that works, and we'll depress the plunger. And that's it. It powers up. So it looks like the wiring is done correctly. Limit switch and everything is wired correctly. And it's probably going to mount somewhere here. And we'll have a little piece of wood on the lid. That when the lid comes down and closes it, it engages that and turns on the power. So I want to go over this timer real quick with you. Uh, I'm sorry, the wiring for everything. This is the upper half, the lid. And of course, the, this, this represents the lower half, which is the base of the box. And this is a wiring diagram. 
I'll go over it briefly and then I'll leave a screenshot of it there for you to capture it if you want. And I want to explain it one more time so that it makes sense to everybody, even people not familiar with wiring. So this is where the power comes in to the electrical socket. It's 120 volts. And then in comes our black power line and goes to the timer. From the timer, that line goes over to the limit switch. From the limit switch, it comes over to a junction point, which basically will split and go to the two ballasts, the upper and the lower ballast. So hopefully that made sense. It splits and goes to both ballasts. Then, coming from both ballasts is the return. I've drawn it here in red, but this is the white wire. It comes out, connects, and goes back to the power socket. And of course the green does the same thing. The ground comes from each and then comes together and also goes back to the power socket. That way the power socket's grounded. Then from the ballast, we have our extra wires capped, of course. Well, let's talk about these. We're using one blue and one red, and they go to the extreme outer ends of that, and then all four extra wires are capped. And it's the exact same thing for the upper and the lower, of course. We'll use one red and one blue line, and then we'll go to the two extreme outside ends of the socket, and then we'll cap the extra wires. And that's it. That's the extent of the wiring diagram. I'm going to put this shot up here. If you want to take a screenshot of this, you can refer to this as you're doing your wiring. After the wiring, I went ahead and finished the box, put the plywood sheet in, and put all of the rest of the reflective surface. Then I got some 3 quarter inch aluminum square tubing. You can buy this at any big box store or you can get it online. I'll put a link to it in the description below, of course. And I'm going to make the grid, the surface that's going to hold the masks or whatever else you want to sanitize, I'm going to make the grid out of this. This is going to be the framework to hold the grid and I'm going to run wire, uh, kind of weave wire across the top of the framework. And so after I cut these pieces all to length, then I'm going to have to file the edges down a little bit so that we can get some brazing compound in there. And you see what that looks like after it's been properly filed. That gives us space to get brazing compound in there. And to put the brazing compound, we need to heat this up with a torch. I used MAP gas, which is the stuff that comes in the yellow tube, and you can get a torch pretty cheap. Once you heat the aluminum up, you can get an aluminum brazing rod, and it will just melt in those joints, and it will seal this up. It'll be very strong. It'll be as if this whole aluminum thing is just one piece. Then I'm going to go around the perimeter. I've marked one inches, or one inch on center, all the way around, and I'm going to drill a hole in all of these. It's just about a one-eighth of an inch hole all the way around and I'm going to run the wire through that. I'm going to use picture hanging wire. Now you see that aluminum is sticking up because the drill pokes through but just a piece of 80 grit sandpaper on any sander will sand that aluminum flat. Here's the picture hanging wire that I'm going to use and I've just kind of threaded this all the way through. I've gone across then down up the next one across down up the next one and so forth all the way along one side and then all the way along the second side. And you see my aluminum uh, tubing there has got the corners cut off. Those corners are cut off to allow the wires to come up in the box. You'll see that as soon as we get to the inside of the box. You'll see how it goes together. But once I have the wires fed, then I'll pull them snug. And then I'll run the wires the other direction. I'll pull those snug. And I, I've woven those through. So for the, the second row, I went over, under, over, under. And that just created a nice grid so light can still get up through there. Now we need to make sure that these bulbs can stay secure in the box. If they just have to hang from the socket themselves, they're going to not, not be very strong and they might tend to unplug themselves. So I've got a little bracket that I made and the bracket has some clips on it which will hold the bulbs in place. And you can see how I'm going to put this in here. And we're going to screw this down to the box with the bracket holding this in place and that's going to allow it to be strong. To, if the uh, box gets jostled around or something like that, it's not going to cause any issues. The bulb isn't going to unplug itself. And I've covered all of this in reflective tape as well. And I've pre-drilled the necessary holes with countersink and we'll screw this together and screw it down. Next I'm going to use the grinder to cut the hinge to length. We're just using a standard piano hinge for this. I am using stainless steel. Everything is stainless steel and just a regular angle grinder with a, a metal cutting cutting blade on there. And I'm going to file the sharp edges off of that. 
And you can probably see I have a large clamp there holding the upper and lower box together from left to right just to keep them nice and snug together. And I'll just pre-drill each of these holes a little bit. I get drill it to as close as you can to the center as possible and then insert the screws. And if you buy a stainless steel hinge it will also have stainless steel screws that accompany it. So when I got to this point, I realized this is kind of a big unwieldy box and it's not very easy to uh, pick up and carry from place to place. So I wanted to put a bit of a handle on it. So I just took and traced a shape out like this here out of plywood. I used three quarter inch Baltic birch for this. Half inch would have been just fine. And sanded it smooth. I routered over the edges. And I've got a one inch oak dowel that I'm using. Oak is really strong for the handle. So I'm just gonna drill a one inch hole through all of these. I'll put a little bit of glue there where that's going to go. I'm, I didn't let the glue go uh, past the rough outline of where it was. And I'll just loosely fit these on onto the dowel. And I've got some blocks there to space this at the right height on both sides. And I'll just hold it in place. And you see I've got a little board between the dowel and the, uh, the case to keep it off a certain distance. And then I'll just screw that in. And that works for handle. We'll do the same thing on the other side and this will just make it a lot easier to carry. One of the final touches is I need to put some trim around the top inside of the lid so that when the lid closes, it uh, we can't see light coming through the crack. That's important. So I, I've, I've beveled it on one side and I'll, I'll let that bevel go like this. You can see the orientation there. And I've mitered it on the ends. But that bevel is so that the box lid will close easily so there's nothing to rub or bump. But this little trim piece hangs down just a little bit below the lid so it will comfortably go over the bottom portion of the box. You can see how that works here. I've got one piece on and that'll prevent light from just coming straight out. If you do see a little bit of UV light that comes through, it will have had to bounce on the wood in order to get out and that's fine because the wood is going to absorb the UV and nothing's going to be able to bounce out. No harmful light. And you see I have the limit switch there set up I've just screwed that into the side and I've got a little block there to plug that uh, to that goes over the limit switch in order to activate it. You can see that right there. Now I'm going to take the meter outside and do some testing. So I'm pointing up, we've got 11, 5, 9, 4, depending on where I point it, towards the ground it's 3, 4 micro watts per square centimeter. Micro watt is a very tiny amount. Pointed right at the sun, I've got 35, 33, 36 micro watts per square centimeter. Now this measures, of course, ultraviolet C. Virtually all of the ultraviolet C is stopped by the ozone layer, so what comes through isn't really harmful to you. 35 microwatts, like I said, is an extremely tiny amount. So we're gonna check it out inside here. So my fluorescent light, the ambient light here, is showing two microwatts. That could even be an anomaly. That's such a small number. It doesn't really make any difference. But we're gonna test the box itself. So I've got that turned on. Oh, I'll turn it on now here. I'm gonna turn the timer on. It actually doesn't matter what order you turn those on in. And so we do have light. We can verify because I've put holes in this and I've filled them with hot melt glue. But you can see they've turned purple there, kind of a bluish purple, indicating my light bulbs are actually on. And UV is not gonna come through the hot melt glue. And we'll hold the meter up here and it looks like we're getting two to three microwatts around the crack. So it's the same as the ambient uh, ultraviolet C in the room. There's no light coming out. So that little trim piece I put in did effectively kill any UV that might come out. So if we turn off all the lights in the shop, you may see a hint of a light there, but there's nothing dangerous coming out of the edge of the box at all. So now we're going to test it inside of the box. I've got the meter pointed up and we're going to turn it on and see what this goes to. So we've got 4200 microwatts. Now, we're going to use milliwatts for most of our calculations, so that would be 4.2 milliwatts per square centimeter of light. And then what I did is I proceeded to move around the box all over the place and checked the various readings in different locations. I wanted to find the location in the box that had the lowest possible reading, and that was over in the corner. And you see that comes in at about 2200 microwatts, which is 2.2 milliwatts per square centimeter. And so we've checked it everywhere, and it looks like right at around 2,000, you can see that that light pops on when it comes on. Right around 2,000 is our uh, lowest rating. 
everywhere in the box. So we'll base our calculations on that. And this is basically how the box will work. I've put a chain on it here with some screws into the side to hold it partially open for us. And you can see the grid on the inside, how it fits. The corner cuts had to go in to make space for the limit switch and for the wires that go from the top to the bottom. I wanted to point out here that I did connect the wires from the top of the box to the bottom through the tape there. And I've just connected white to white, black to black, and green to green. And then loading it and using it is actually pretty simple. We just set the masks on the surface here. It doesn't really matter which way you put them. Uh, this way down or the other way down is all fine because this box is equally illuminated from all sides. Close the lid, uh, make sure the power's on, and turn the timer on, and that starts it. Set your time. Uh, I've set it for five minutes there, but in reality, you've got to set it for 10 minutes. That's the math on this to guarantee that the virus is completely neutralized it is 10 minutes. You verify uh, through those two portals that the light is on. And when the light goes off, it's done. And then you take the masks out, and they're clean and ready to go. The one final thing you have to do, according to the CDC, is check the physical integrity of the mask and the strap. After a number of cycles, they'll break down, probably somewhere between 20 and 30 cycles. Once they break down, they're no longer considered safe. So I'm going to take a minute to go over the calculations. We found wherever I put the meter in the box, the point that got the lowest amount of light got 2,000 microwatts per square centimeter of light. That is equivalent to 2 milliwatts per square centimeter of UVC output. And 2 milliwatts per square centimeter of output times 500 seconds equals 1,000 millijoules per square centimeter of energy. And that's equivalent to 1 joule per square centimeter of energy, which is exactly twice what the CDC says is required to fully penetrate the masks and kill the virus. Finally, if we take that 500 seconds worth of time, divide that by 60 seconds in a minute, we'll get 8.33 minutes that you need to set the timer for. So if you round that up to 10 minutes, you're guaranteed to totally sanitize the surface and have a mask that's ready to go. And incidentally, this will clean anything. It doesn't have to be a mask. Anything you put in the box will be sanitized. Thank you all so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about the science behind this box, how it works, why it works, things like that, I have a link in the description to my science channel where I have a short video there and I explain all of that in depth. And like I said at the beginning, if this is something that you're interested in for your hospital or clinic, please reach out to me. Um, I'm giving this box away, of course, and if I need to make more, I'll make what I can to help out the situation. And for all my viewers and everybody who watches this out there, I hope you guys all stay safe and uh, take care. Thanks for watching.